All right, so welcome to Brave Carrier Training. Uh, so just first of all, like what kind of experiences do people here have with carriers already? Lots. Them a lot, like four years ago. Okay, so uh, the whole range. All right, so I want to go in just a little bit first about the the general cap basics. Uh, I think like one of the one of the biggest things of is like where they can dock. Uh, so for citadels, they're pr they're limited pretty much just to um, large and extra large structures. That should be keep stars, fortizars, and sotillos, if I recall correctly. There's a, a special exemption for like rock walls with tataras, but uh, in in general, just um, like stick to large and XL structures, and uh, don't accidentally go to an astrohus or something. There are some advantages to citadels, especially in that you can tether, uh, and you can basically dock up immediately. But there is the thing where, you know, the, the size. Oh yeah, also they can, citadels can be anywhere, which is nice. Uh, I am a, actually a big proponent of NPC stations in general, because you can always dock in an NPC station. Uh, the only thing is that some models are a little bit better than others. Uh, also, uh, with citadels, you can't dock if you're scrammed and you basically can always dock in a npc station as long as you don't have aggression okay this is also where my memory is a little bit fuzzy uh do you, check, do you remember what the restrictions are on uh taking gates in a capital you can take any gate as long as you're not pick pointed yeah so that's kind of a, a unique thing to caps that you should Try to be aware of. Well, one modification: you can't in a poach run, and you can't get into high sec, obviously. Yeah, and uh, you can you can go into wormholes, but only through very large holes. And uh, hopefully, you have a good reason for doing that. Uh, yeah, the other thing is the jumping, which is the the major advantages of uh, a capital. It's kind of the, the Ability to instantaneously insert yourself into a particular location. Uh, so for the majority of people, at first, you tend to just go where the FC tells you with provided Sinos. And then you're mainly going to be trying to see if you're in range of something. Uh, a, a way of kind of quickly seeing if you're, you're in range is when you're sitting in a carrier or other thing that can jump and you open up your map there'll be a big gray bubble that will show your current range and the systems that you can hit from where you currently are uh, just be aware that kind of around the edges it can be a little bit deceiving you have to watch it from above and from the side because it is uh, elliptical yeah uh, otherwise, the the thing that most people do is they just go to uh, dot .lan, and I'll just uh, link that here. And that's that's just the the quick way of checking. You just put in the system that you're in and the system that you want to go to, and it will tell you uh, if it's in range, how much fuel it will take to get there, and if it's not in range some potential midpoints that you can use. Though I think uh, I think choosing specific midpoints is probably its own class. Uh, so capitals can only jump to a, they have to jump to a Sino, of course. Uh, and that's either going to be on a Force Recon. It can also be uh, on a mobile Sino beacon, which requires anchoring three on an alt and 400 cubic meters of cargo space. So that can be in a T1 industrial or uh, even a T1 exploration frigate. And those uh, last for an hour, so that's 
Uh, very nice if you limited on alts. You can even drop them on your capital character uh, and then uh, gate back in a subcap back to where your capital is and then jump to your own Sino as long as you stay in your own fleet. As a note, you can jump to a jump beacon. In general, you should avoid doing that unless you already have eyes on the system. Uh, because those are, are very popular targets for um, camps. And like it's it's not very common that we have blue scouts for like regular carriers, but like people in local who are blue are not necessarily always friendly. So just keep that in mind. They can also technically go through Ansiplexes, but Boss Boys would ask that you don't do that or else we'll cry. Other than that, uh, if you're planning on jumping to a system, you'll want to check if there's uh, Sino gemming, which should be visible like underneath the system name and next to the little uh, sovereignty badges. Where like in, in M MTACO here, there's Apocalypse Now and then CCP and then a, a little whirly symbol and then the ADM badge. The little whirly thing tells you if it's jammed currently or not. It's kind of a, a bummer if you're all set up to jump and then it's jammed. Uh, for which Sinos you could go to, be wary of people who are just saying that they're the Sino you should jump to. You'll generally want to jump to something that you either have eyes on or that you know is the FC, because spy Sinos do happen. Okay, the other thing is then uh, how much fuel you should have. That's often specified by the FC, but otherwise I usually do about uh, 45, uh, like 45, 50, or 55. Uh, don't fill up your entire fuel bay unless you're told to, because like, you're, you're basically never going to be going that far. Uh, a jammer, I, the question in chat is does a jammer block both jumps in and jumps out? It only blocks jumps in, so you can always jump out. Does the Sino jammer block jumping in if the Sino was up before the jammer? That I'm not sure. It doesn't. The, if the Sino is lit before a Sino jammer goes up, uh, the Sino will uh, continue to burn for a duration, but you won't be able to light a new one afterwards. All right, thanks. That is uh, good to know. Okay, so I think that's that's basically everything I want to talk about that's general cap stuff. So I'm going to go into like the differences between fighters, or uh, sorry, between carriers. So the, the four typical carriers, and in Brave we mainly use the two, but uh, they're kind of split between uh, armor and shield, where there's uh, two carriers that are more geared towards armor and two that are more geared towards shield, with the, uh, the Midhogger and Chimera being shield and the Archon and Thanatos being uh, armor. And then within those, they're split between one carrier that uh, has buffs to fighter damage and uh, and other uh, kind of fighter damage adjacent things, and one that's bonused more towards increased tank. Uh, in Brave, we tend to favor the Nidhogger, and that's because it's um, it's uh, the Nidhogger is favored for the shield because it's got the bonus to fighter speed, especially. Uh, which kind of goes hand in hand with damage because, like, the faster your fighters get there, the sooner you're applying damage. Uh, it also has a larger fighter hanger, and it has a bonus to uh, the Dromi web range, which is the the stasis webifying uh, fighter. And uh, the actual hull itself, I believe, is faster too. So it's it's bonus to all nice things. Uh, the Chimera, on the other hand, is, is tankier, and it's sometimes more used by like FC, but 
like as an FC boat because it can uh, take reps better. Um, and sometimes as a Lynx ship, though all carriers can fit Lynx. And they get a pretty decent bonus to it too. They're all good. Uh, I think maybe the Shield Thanatos is not the best option unless you particularly love that. But uh, like having good skills both in game and also technically goes a long way in uh, making up the difference. I this is the comment that Shield Fanny, if you love receiving SRP, I would. I mean, maybe if we got better carrier SRP. <laughs> The shield Thanatos does the most damage by far, at least. Yeah, I guess there's that. If you love doing damage, does that that one also has some? Um, I don't think it has the bonus to fighter speed, but it has the bonus to um, damage at least, and it has all those low slots. Okay, uh, should I go over parts of a carrier? At least cover fighter support units and NSAs. Okay. I was actually going to start with the cap booster. Because the, the cap is kind of the most important part. And a lot of times you're jumping onto tether, especially like strat op fleets, but sometimes you're not. And also when you first jump in, yeah, I guess I should also mention this. Whenever you first jump into a place, uh, first you have your invulnerability timer, and then after your invulnerability timer, uh, in, in which like, you can't be locked, then your tether timer starts. And you've probably like seen the little icon every time you uh, take a Titan Bridge or something, where there's like, the little uh, tether symbol with a like line through it on the uh, next to the HUD. And that is particularly important with caps when you're not jumping onto a Fortizar because you can't dock up and that's the, the time until you can tether. So up until you tether, you can be locked by the enemy. Uh, and if you're scrammed, then you can't go onto tether. And also you're not getting capacitor because you're not getting the, the repair. And also, as soon as you put out uh, fighters or get aggression, then you're also not going to be tethering again. So yeah, in general, the, the cap booster is very important for being able to get your cap up again. And that's, that's not only for your tank, though that is important. It's also so that you can jump back out at the end, because you need to have quite a bit of capacitor in order to jump out. Do you remember like the exact percentage? Seventy-five. Yeah, seventy-five percent. So yeah, like as soon as you jump in, you're basically going to be uh, double-clicking in space to break your invulnerability so that you tether sooner. And if you're jumping out into the middle of nowhere, then you're going to be cycling your cap booster uh, like a like a madman. Um, yeah, the, the other thing is the NSA. Uh, the, or the network sensor array. That's it works kind of like a siege, except I, I believe you can still move, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can still move, but you can't jump out and you can't warp. So it's it's basically like a scram, but it does give you really good lock speed. And that's that's basically the the whole thing. So that is you should generally not just let that be running unless you're fighting subcaps or something. It also makes it impossible to use electronic warfare from you. So no uh no ECMing people in your carrier. Yeah. Yeah. Well keep that in mind. Uh yeah, the other thing is um there's the tank and the uh like some mix of damage and range of your damage and speed of your damage, uh, aka fighters. Uh, there's uh, you have some anti-tackle mods like the uh, the smart bomb and to a large extent the newt. Like the carriers are usually not dropped at zero on stuff, but like if something comes close to you, then you can 
certainly nude it and um, the smart bombs are good for hazing tackle and also for uh, getting bubbles off. Uh, as I mentioned, they can be refit to Lynx, so that's kind of situational because generally you're trying to avoid aggression unless it's necessary. They can also sometimes be fit to go f speedy, which is unusual for caps. And that's why they sometimes have like the, the micro warp drive or afterburner fit, like the, the capital size version. And then there's like your refits for travel, which I uh, included in the fits in the MOTD. And those are uh, those are the kinds of things where like generally you're hoping you don't need them. But always keep in mind that as long as you're next to another cap, uh, and that cap is in your fleet, you can refit at any time, basically, as long as you don't have aggression. It's like if you need more, um, like if you need to like refit to inertial stabilizers or to a capacitor or a cloak, then you can do that. And that can be useful sometimes if you're like stuck in a bubble and that's your only way out or something. Or if you just get stranded in space somewhere and you log back in and you're like, huh, there isn't anything here that I can duck up in. And that's why you've got your mobile depot. Okay, uh, fighters. So there are three basic types of fighters. There are uh, what are called light fighters, space superiority fighters, which is usually shortened to SS, and support fighters. For the lights, we basically for fighting, at least, we basically use energies or Templars. Uh, energies, especially because they're fast. Uh, and for space purity, usually equites or grams. I think uh, I think part of it also is like the the MR ones just have a nice mix of speed and uh, damage profile. Does that sound about about right? Yeah, and slightly better tracking too. Ah, uh, yeah, the tracking. Yeah, that's important. So the uh, space purity fighters have perfect f tracking anyway, I believe. And for support, it's basically only dromies and sirens. I guess you should back up a little bit. That uh, So the light fighters are for damaging stuff, like especially larger things, or like anything larger than a frigate or destroyer, I, I should say. Uh, the space purity is like usually like killing other fighters, but can also hit uh, frigates pretty well. And the support fighters, basically the only ones that anyone ever uses are dromies and sirens. And even then, heavily biased towards dromies. Also, they're huge. Uh, the dromies are web uh, fighters, and the sirens scram, which can be useful, but the problem is that sirens are really slow. So, like, usually we don't do those, but it, it can also be useful if someone has them if, uh, if we do want to scram something. Uh, the other thing I think is kind of misleading on the wiki is how many fighters you should have and what kinds. Like, they kind of make it sound like you should have a mix of different kinds, but I think in general you want all the same race of each type, because as your wings deplete, you want to be able to refill partial wings from the ones you already have, assuming that they don't like, completely die. And if you have like a mix of energies and fear bulks, then you might be out of luck if you've got like three fear bulks and six energies, because then you could have had a full wing, but now you have to have two partial wings. But I should say we do sometimes use fear bulks for bashing, just because it's so much damage. But they're slow is kind of the problem. Not the slowest. Well, I guess they are literally the slowest as far as light fighters go, but uh, it's significant. And, and you can always see on uh, skynetting structure bashes who brought the fear bulks uh, without mousing over them because they'll be lagging way behind the pack. So when you join a fleet, the FC will basically always say how many of each you should have, but you should be prepared for potentially all space superiority fighters or all damage and maybe one to two flights of support uh, usually only one if at all and you should order these ahead of time because they're they can be kind of expensive and when there's a big op they'll just uh, all get bought up 
And they're very large. Yeah, they're also really big. Uh, oh yeah, and use T1 fighters as a rule in PvP unless you're rich. And I, I mean like rich in terms of like you truly don't care. Uh, you do get fighter SRP, but only if the whole wing dies. And that, because uh, that's the only time you get a kill mail. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, when you're loading up your fighter bay, and I guess at this point you should take a look at your fighter bay. What I do is I load two tubes, and then I put in, so like usually in a ping it will say something like have three tubes damage and then three flights light fighter and rest SS fighters will be how it's written. So in my case I decided to have, uh, just for this, have 36 space superiority fighters and the rest damage and three sets of light fighters in the tubes. But I start out with two in the tubes, and then I put in the number of specified SS fighters, and then I fill it, fill all the rest with energies while keeping that one tube empty. Because if you want to switch fighters at any point while you're undocked, you need enough space to empty a fighter tube in order to make the switch. And that will depend on your specific carrier. Because again, the uh, the Chimera has a much smaller bay, and also your level of fighter hangar management, and it's it's a balance between having the maximum number of fighters and also still being able to switch if you need to. Uh, because in a, a carrier, like the number of fighters you have, like if you run out of fighters, you're basically useless at that point, unless you're giving links, I guess. And uh, that's that's when they talk about the defanging fighters. All right, so I think at about this time, like assuming you've got your fighters sorted and your isotopes, I'm going to link my Sino character. Right, I'm, actually, I'm going to see up in fleet, and you should flag exempt. Yeah, so it's it's as noted in the. Um, the fleet chat here, you usually want to like either add the Sino to watch list, or you can just um, directly click on the name from anywhere, like in the in the chat or like linked somewhere, and just select jump to member. We don't like doing from the capacitor because there can be Sino beacons there in other places, and then that's going to uh, potentially end up with you. Uh, off in some other system if you slightly misclick. Okay, so once you land, uh, double click in space and then stop your ship. And if you're bumping, it would be a good idea to spread out a little bit. This is just a uh, uh, handy Fortisar out here. Okay, yeah, if you forgot fuel, that's okay. Just uh, buy a bit and if you need ISK for that because somebody messed with the prices, just let me know and I'll send you some. Okay, now the first people who've jumped in should be tethered and basically capped yeah. up all the way. Yeah, my uh, my first carrier training was actually a super carrier training, and I had never used a fighter before, so that was a bit embarrassing. I was uh, still, my last cap experience was basically from when they were... Um, just fancy drones. All right, so if uh, this is, if you are like unused to being in a carrier, you might be wondering where your fighters are. And there is a itty bitty tiny button down next to the innermost uh, low slot, at least with the HUD on the bottom. And that's the toggle between modules and fighters. Toggling is kind of uh, like not great, so what you can actually do is um, there's another little button when you're in the fighter view mode, like at the bottom of the three in the stack, That's you can click and drag and pull your fighter HUD up above your modules or to like wherever you want on the screen. Uh, another thing I kind of suggest is uh, there's a whole unused part 
of the the short key or that or the short shortcuts menu that by default doesn't have anything. Uh, that's the fighter menu. And so it can be useful to set something to uh, launch all fighters or uh, select all fighters or recall all fighters. So go ahead and launch your fighters. Yeah, so Angie does uh, ship selection as spacebar. Uh, for me, I have spacebar set to target lock. I do mine to M. And uh, yeah, toggle between fighter and ship is a really nice button to have as well. Like it's, it's kind of arguably the most important, I think. So you'll probably see a little, like there's a little blue halo around your fighters probably. And then if you click on your own HUD, the little blue halo will be, will be around your ship. The thing that's really easy to mess up with carriers is sending your carrier off to go somewhere while your fighters just stay there wondering when you're going to give them orders. Because, uh, yeah, like if you if you have your, your carrier selected but not your fighters, I guess backing up a little bit, moving your fighters is the same as moving your ship. It's all the same commands, uh, I think, basically, except for double-clicking in space. And the contextual part of it is which one you have selected. So, yeah, highly recommend doing a toggle. Uh, you can also do, like, the specific ones. Uh, you can also do, like, shift-click to have all of them. Like, if you start with number one selected and then go to number three. Yeah, so send your fighters now to go orbit mobile depot number one. Yeah, so you can kind of see um, my fighters are quite a bit slower than the hells here. Uh, yeah, the Hells and the uh, the Nidhoggers. And that's just because I'm in a Chimera. I should mention there there are two ways of sending your fighters over. You can either send them over to orbit, or you can send them over uh, with the uh, attack, which I see a couple people have done. Uh, if you select attack, which is like the, the bottom most ability, then they will just go over there and automatically orbit at their optimal. Uh, there's also another important, like, situationally important but handy thing to know is that if you send them over using attack and then you specify orbit, um, you can set a different orbit distance than their maximum. Or, I mean, they're, they're normal, they're their default. Oh, you just uh, gated over, I see. So no, wasn't the... Sorry, I, uh, it's a force of habit I always red cycle, even though nobody's allowed to shoot you on uh, CC outside of good testing systems. So yeah, setting a different orbit distance is really useful when doing um, bashing especially, depending on the specific thing that you're bashing. Like if, if you're bashing something with PDS, you can sometimes uh, like if you refit to have like optimal range scripts and tracking computers, you can often uh, set them so that they're orbiting outside of PDS range. But if you're just doing the default orbit, then they'll be right cozied up in there to PDS. Yeah, that's my uh, my birds are a bit excited. I should also mention all fighters have some kind of prop mod ability. So for energies and a lot of light fighters, I think maybe all light fighters, that's uh, the micro warp drive, and that goes on a cooldown. So if you're burning them over somewhere, that's, you're usually wanting to uh, be pulsing that whenever you can. And they also have a, uh, a rocket salvo, which is like a one bit of extra damage, and they get uh, a set number of those, and then they have to come back to your hangar bay to, to rearm. And that's uh, that's different depending on the fighter. 
like the specific ones, like for these, uh, for heavy fighters and supers, that's actually a, a micro jump drive. And that gets a little bit tricky because you have to do um, Q clicking. I should turn my tank on since generally you want to have your tank on so you don't forget it. So it's useful to have your tactical overview up and some liberal use of the look at function. Okay, uh, so now move your fighters over to the next mobile depot, number two. And the next thing I was going to talk about was Q-click. Because, like, it's all well and good if you're sending your fighters over to orbit something specific. But if there's nothing there, you can still send them over there. Because if you hold Q, you can set a distance from yourself. And then you click. Then you specify, like, how far up or down it should be. And then you click again and your fighters will go over to that spot. So now send your fighters over in between the two mobile depot 3s. Alright, thanks for coming, Marines. And since I'm sitting here, I'm actually going to refit my carrier to drone speed. Well, I will in a moment. Uh, and for our... Uh, actually, I think now that I've opened up my... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if uh, control space works with fighters. I expect... Probably not. Doesn't. Yeah. Like, the mechanics are a little bit weird. Yeah, that's, uh, I should, I should probably make a video the next time I, uh, do this. But at least there's a recording. Uh, apparently it will, uh, still stop your ship, which is useful. Because so I believe even, uh, going into the fitting window just now, it just, uh, selected my ship, though I'm not moving. Yeah, that's that's useful if you've like accidentally uh moved yourself or if you're bumping or uh any other thing. So yeah, my uh my next thing was just uh seeing if you could manage to get in between all of these uh mobile depots with the navigation just to get comfortable with it. Uh, your your fighters will stop once they get to a spot, or once your target has died, and that is potentially fatal because they um they die uh, they they live and die basically on their uh, speed and transversal. So you'll you'll generally want to be setting them off from the next target as the old one is dying. And you see mine have like sped up a lot just since I refit to drone. Uh, navigation computers. But since I don't have aggression, I can just refit at any time, basically. Uh, back to tank. Yeah, now mine have uh, completely gone off the rails here. I just needed to look at a new target. I guess uh, looking at your fighters themselves is probably the easiest. Uh, you can also send your fighters off in different directions, like the three wings. Uh, 
I see some people are sending theirs off uh, either towards the gate or the city. The Igoras. Those eliminators are going to be eliminated. Fair enough. Yeah, uh, so you have like, you probably notice you have incredible lock range on these. Like, I I think we're probably not allowed to do bash it, but it, you can just lock up the city from over here or those rats. Can we cover like, warping for the fighters yet? Uh, we did not. So, uh, if you just hit uh, recall all fighters, as long as they're at warp range from you, they'll just warp back to you. You can also uh, just select one flight to warp back. Like if if one of them needs to restock, or uh, like because it's short staffed or needs more torpedo volleys or something, or rocket salvos. Uh, but if they're scrammed, they can't work back, and if they're bubbled, they can't work back. So they kind of follow normal ship rules in that sense. It also does take some time for them to come back. So sometimes the fastest thing to do, like especially if they are scrammed. Uh, because having fighters out prevents you from tethering, then the quickest thing to do is to abandon your squadrons, like if it's a real emergency, and then make sure that you don't have anything locked and that you're not aggressed. And that's the, the fastest way to get back on tether if, uh, if the KFC is calling for people to tether up. Or, like, usually it, it might be a good preventative thing if there's like suddenly a bunch of dreads next to you or something and they're not your friends uh, and that's also kind of like yeah you don't want there to be suddenly dreads yeah also um even if you warp off yeah i believe if you warp off they still warp back to you right yep yeah yeah you actually uh a lot of times what you want to do if you're like in a site and you newts come in and you need to warp as you start your warp, recall them mid-warp so they're not on grid, then you abandon them. And then by the time you land, uh, you can tether up and recover them later. But if you leave them on grid, then if you're farming with it, then uh, they'll just be killed. Die. Yeah. That's actually a good advice to give, uh, also because of what Drigo and Kaliati are mentioning in Fleet. So if you warp Let's say you're ratting with your uh, with your carrier. If you warp back to the structure, uh, even though you're and your fighters are still out, um, that means you won't be able to tether. Um, it also means that if you recall them too early, so before you fully land it, they will land far away from you, and you won't be able to warp them back to you. Um, if you dock up with your fighters still out, you technically ab abandon them. You cannot reconnect to them like you can with regular drones. If you want them back, you're going to need to have an industrial scoop them up wing by wing and um, bring them back to you probably in the structure that you are docked up in. You cannot in space reconnect to your fighters. Yeah, and uh, Andromeda points out you have to combat scan them if they're out in space. Yep. Yeah, but uh, since ratting tends to use T2 fighters a bit more often than uh, PvP, that's definitely worth the time. Most likely, yeah. Yeah, those are some good tips. I don't really uh, do much... Uh, well, I don't do any carry ratting. I did it like once in catch for an ADM fleet, and I lost a couple of fighters, so I was ISK negative. It's, uh, it's pretty intense. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess, like, can we think of uh, other things that are useful? Oh, I just realized they, they just changed something. I just warped and recalled them mid-warp, and the fighters waited till I land, and they come to me. That is not how I remember it interacting. Mm, no, I thought that they would just... As, as if you would have warped to the FC mid warp, so you would just land. They would just warp to that particular point. That's what I thought, but I just did it 
there and they waited until I landed then warped. Yeah, they come all the way Maybe back to you. And if you hit your afterburners, they'll come back faster. That oh, must be a change. Okay. Or maybe because I'm still on the grid. I can try again by warping to something farther away. No, it definitely works. That's how I rat. Oh, shit. Okay, well, you don't even need to... <laughs> it used to be they would... Uh, you'd have to get them off grid. I don't know. There'd be a lot more micromanaging on them. That's a good change. Uh, I think that one thing that might be still interesting, it's a bit more pressing for um, supercarriers with anti cap fighters. Uh, however, it's still good to mention, um, as Ariane already mentioned, the shooting, micro driving, and the third module on your um, fighters is a rocket volley, or for most of them, it's a rocket volley. For some heavy fighters, it's bombing, which is difficult and difficult to execute well. Um, however, in some situations, it's the general advice is that it's better to wait for the FC to call when volleys are needed, uh, most likely because you want to sync them up to um, alpha through a shield. Whereas if you trickle and everyone volleys at their own um, time, you can run into the fact that the target you're trying to kill has a gets back traps and then just lives. Um, so in most situations, it's better to just wait for the cap FC to uh, call out the, the volleys. In our fleets, I feel like we've rarely had them called out. Like, there are not that many times where we get to do it, but when we are fighting like fighters against subcaps that are trying to get through a gate or something like that. Yeah, the thing is that for most of those occasions, you tend to have enough DPS in the primary weapons of the fighters themselves. Uh, and at that point, it's probably better to spread out your uh, DPS because you probably run into the fact that there's quite a lot of overkill in carriers versus subcaps. It's mostly, it, again, it mostly tends to be a thing for, for um, super carriers with uh, anti-cap fighters because their volleys hit hard, uh, like really hard. And for instance, in that kind of situation, if you want to volley through uh, a fax or a dread or something like that, it's better to sync them up versus uh, doing them spread out because at that point they might be enough reps uh, or they might just have a self rep that they can uh, that they can get off. Yeah, I guess if you uh Kev is finding out that if you double if you double click in space you yourself will still move. Yeah. Which in certain scenarios might be a good thing, but Do we want to test shooting something? We have a fax and some hells on grid that the carriers can shoot. Well, yeah, please shoot. shoot the hell, but the fax should be able to keep me alive. Please shoot me. 